Hello, my name is Katherine Moore, social worker, mom, coffee lover, and founder of Social Workers Rise, where we inspire social workers to connect, expand their knowledge, and change more lives than they ever thought possible. I'm so excited you found my podcast. We will talk everything social work on every level from micro to macro. We will hear the stories of social workers who are doing big things, learn new skills, and most importantly, give you actionable steps to make a difference today. Let's go. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. It is our 89th episode today, and I'm so excited that you are here. This week, we are talking with Kara Crosswaite Brindle. She is the co founder and co author of The Empowerment Model of Clinical Supervision. She is also a TEDx speaker, a licensed professional counselor, financial therapist, and burnout consultant located in beautiful Denver, Colorado. Kara's greatest joy is engaging fellow mental health professionals in clinical supervision, supervision of supervision, and mental health leadership and development. If you want some extra free resources for clinical supervision, she is sharing those with you right now at empowermentmodelsupervision.com. You can find that link in the bio. And in here, we really just have a conversation around what is the empowerment model how did she develop this and how did she go from being a counselor to a author and TEDx speaker? How do you get the confidence to do that? So I'm really excited for you to listen to our conversation. We're going to hop right into it after this ad from our sponsor, The Rise Directory. This episode is proudly brought to you by the Rise Directory, a national directory of clinical supervisors who are dedicated to helping the next generation of clinical social workers grow in their clinical skills. The link is in the show notes. Check it out and tell every clinical supervisor you know about this directory. Hello, welcome to another episode of Social Workers Rise. We are here with Kara Crosswaite Brindle. Uh, She is the author of the Empowerment, oh my gosh, I'm going to butcher this, the Empowerment Model of Clinical Supervision. Is that right? (laughs) Yeah, that's it. That's a mouthful. (laughs) Yes, yes. Thank you so much for being here today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to talk about this. Yes, yes, definitely. So, uh, so how did you first, let's kind of start with, you know, overall, like, what do you do? Um, you know, who are you? Yeah, absolutely. So I know we're here to talk about supervision, but I consider myself a serial entrepreneur. So I have lots of different fun projects. I'm a mental health therapist, licensed professional counselor here in Denver, Colorado. I recently started pursuing financial therapy, which is so fun. I definitely could talk about that all day. Um, I'm a TEDx speaker, a published author, a professor. I just do a little bit of everything. I don't like to be bored. (laughs) I love it. I definitely relate to that. Definitely relate. So how did you come up with the empowerment model of clinical supervision? And can you tell us, you know, where did this journey begin for you? Absolutely. So this is a book that was co-written and co-owned with me and my former supervisor, Christina Murphy. So Christina was my supervisor in community mental health. She was my first supervisor outside of grad school, practicum and internship. And she left an impression, a really good impression on me when it came to what a leader looks like, what a supervisor should act like. Um, Frankly, my story is personal in the sense of practicum and internship had pretty horrible supervision experiences. And the more I own that, the more the community starts to share like that they had that too. Uh, Maybe the supervisor wasn't accessible. Maybe they were doing something that felt kind of unethical. In my case, the supervisor wanted to treat me like a client. Um, In fact, I had them look at me and say, Kara, you're too composed for an intern. We want you to cry. I remember that distinctly sitting there with my two supervisors and I just felt ganged up on. 
And I was like, what is this? <laughs> I'm a counselor in training and you're telling me I'm too composed and you want me to cry. And so only later did I realize that that wasn't the norm for supervision um, and that that actually felt more like a client relationship where they were trying to treat me like a client and therapize me. So unfortunately that happened. And so when Christina came into my life and showed me what supervision could be, that was huge for me because I had actually told her, I said, I had a horrible experience. I hope if you're my supervisor, you can do X, Y, Z. And she's like, yep, I can do that. And she followed through. So as I grew under her leadership, I was eventually promoted to being a supervisor myself in community mental health and had a team of 15 therapists underneath me, uh, which is a lot of work and a lot of fun, but definitely some wild stuff happened. <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, I can only imagine. <laughs> Yeah. And so eventually, as I kind of grew into my leadership role, you know, we kept throwing the word of empowerment out there. Like that was a word Christina used a lot. It was a word I started to adopt. Like I really wanted my team to feel empowered, to feel like they had their, I had their back. And so after I left community mental health and went to private practice a couple of years down the road, Christina came back to me and said, you know what? I think we have something here. I think we, we are providing a supervision that looks different. Let's try and like put that out there. So we created the model, we tested it, we did all these things to make sure it had value. And what, what and year was book. this? What year was this when you first when she first came to you? Oh gosh, it might have been 2017, 2018, somewhere in there. And then we started writing the book more seriously. Like we outlined it, had all the ideas, but then really put our nose to the grindstone in 2019. Um, and it was published. Actually, it was published in July 2019. So somewhere between 18 and 19, a lot of the writing was done. Just shows where my mind's at. It feels like forever ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it was a lifetime ago, pre-pandemic. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but really, really not that long ago when you consider, you know, book publishing. That's, yeah. it's quite a feat. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, it was definitely an interesting experience. And, um, you know, now we're trying to update the books. We've learned some additional things in the years that have happened since then. So hopefully we'll have a couple other ideas to put out there for folks. Oh, that's exciting. Definitely keep us updated. Absolutely. So before, before the book came around, did you always know that you wanted to write a book? Was it, was it a thought in your mind or was this just a pure like, yeah, let's do it? <laughs> well, I think because I was already teaching at that time, I was already in an adjunct faculty position. I knew that I wanted to continue to expand my reach. And so whether that was a book or a TEDx or something, I knew I wanted to get further out there with the populations I was serving. So whether it was at-risk youth, which is where I got my start, or with mental health, students, who I serve now, um, you know, I knew I had something to say. And so once I got past some of the vulnerability and imposter syndrome of like, why me? Why would someone want to listen to what we had to say? Um, it was a little bit easier especially because the clinical supervision books out there were a little bit older. You know, everything we did with our lit review was 2005 and earlier. So things have changed a lot since 2005. Yeah, definitely. And that's the struggle that I've been experiencing too, you know, launching the RISE directory and digging into the field of clinical supervision is I don't even want to look at anything that was before 2015 because while it does have, you know, historical significance, I know that we have come so far in the past, what, seven years in terms of diversity, different voices, inclusion. So it's important to me that it is reflected in the research, which a lot of things pre, I don't know, in the 2000s and the 90s, it's its not as diverse as I would like it to be. Right. Absolutely agree. Mm -hmm. So how did you know you were ready to write the book? Because you mentioned overcoming imposter syndrome. And I think that that is a common theme, especially among us in the mental health well, in any profession, but I feel it in the mental health profession because everyone is so freaking smart and everyone, <laughs> like everyone knows so many things about the work that they do. And so just being able to go from, Hey, you know, this would be really cool if I could do that, but who am I and who would actually listen to me? So how did you overcome that? And, um, and actually, you know, put yourself out there to write the book. Yeah, I mean, I think having the support of a co-author really helps because then you're not in it alone. So being able to bounce ideas off of each other, you know, to say, does this make sense? You know, to us, we've been living it. We've been modeling that for years as supervisors. And I took that from community mental health to private practice and it was still working. So I had some confidence that we had something worth, you know, sharing. Um, but then it was also about like, 
how do we put it into words? And we start with a little graphic and, and a little image. And that was the fun part was to be able to say, how do we actually like, capture this in an image that people will eventually recognize as part of the brand? And then the hardest part was saying, let's test it out with some research. So we actually did a study uh, with the community mental health center that Christina was running at the time and had a bunch of supervisors who were in the empowerment model kind of training who'd done all the work and were doing some different tests to show how their supervisees were growing. Then we had a control group who did everything the normal way, the way that they've always been done. Um, and then we saw some statistical significance and that was really exciting to be like, okay, it's not just that we think it has value and you know, emotionally are bought into it. It was showing with the data that we actually had something that was working. So what can you share? I'm curious, what did the data show you? Like what was the improvement? Yeah, so we saw um, additional growth or a faster growth in the supervisees when it came to their competency levels. So we saw an increase in their clinical skills where they're ranking themselves as more competent a little bit faster than folks that were not in that part of the study or were in a control part, control group, I should say. Um, we saw them being a little bit more comfortable with self-advocacy, advocating for the clients because the Community Mental Health Center specifically worked with at-risk families who had an open abuse and neglect case. So it was already a hard population to work with in the sense of barriers and poverty and Medicaid and all the things. Um, and so watching these clinicians who historically underreport their skills, right? They're usually pretty green clinicians coming into the field, um, start to say, I feel like I, I'm competent. I feel like I know what I'm doing in these areas of clinical and advocacy and admin, frankly. That was really exciting to see, but the biggest uptick was their clinical skills. They felt like they were moving faster through their work and they felt like they were doing good work with their clients. Hey, it's Catherine here. I hope you are enjoying this episode. We're going to take a quick break to listen to these ads from our sponsors. Do you want to make your own podcast? Spotify has a platform that lets you make one super easily, then distribute it everywhere and even earn money all in one place for free. It's called Spotify for Podcasters. And this is the platform that I use because it makes it so simple to record and distribute your podcast all in one place using your cell phone. What you need to do is download the Spotify for Podcasters app or go to www.spotify.com backslash podcasters to get started. If you're planning to take the BBS Law and Ethics exam, the ASWB master's or clinical licensure exam, or if you're studying for the MFT exam, then you need a proven program that can help you understand the exam questions and pass with confidence. If this is you, I highly recommend the Therapist Development Center. I personally use TDC to pass my law and ethics and clinical exams and found the program provided me with everything I needed to pass with confidence. TDC's program integrates various ways of learning in an organized fashion, containing all of the information you need to pass without the overwhelm. And now bonus, TDC is also offering a library of continuing education courses that fulfill your license renewal requirements and will support you in your career development. If this sounds like something that you need, visit their website, therapistdevelopmentcenter.com and use the code SWRISE10 at checkout to receive 10% off any of their CE courses, including their brand new course, On the Edge of Life, an Introduction to Suicidality. You can also check out the link in the show notes. Wow, that's great. So what is the empowerment model in a nutshell and what is what sets it apart from other models of clinical supervision? Yeah, so the image itself is really symbolic of what we wanted to represent. So when you look at the image, it's circular instead of a stair step model. So old models have kind of a, you move through these steps and you go up and up and up, kind of like a staircase. And so like they'd say, you'd start as a teacher role as a supervisor and eventually move to colleague. Ours is circular in the sense that it's fluid. You're really showing up to empower the clinician underneath you and maybe you're one day a teacher role and the next day you're a leadership role, depending on what they bring to the table. So for us, the self is always in the middle of the image. And then we have five different roles around the outside, which include leader, teacher, researcher, colleague, and consultant. And so all those roles apply as a supervisor. It's how we show up, it's how we help people, um, but we might just move between them depending on what our supervisee needs. 
Oh, that makes sense. I love that. I'm curious, you know, what were some unexpected challenges that you and your colleague encountered during this process? You know, I think the, the biggest challenge was finding the time to write <laughs> because we both were very much in our practices. I mean, she was running, you know, she's the CEO of that group practice, uh, Community Mental Health Center, actually. So she had, you know, a couple hundred clinicians underneath that were working through these hard cases that have a lot of crises. So for her trying to write it was probably more challenging than for me in private practice. Um, and then the study itself, you know, it was a small sample size just to get going because community mental health has a high turnover for lots of valid reasons, including burnout and getting licensed and moving on their own, those kinds of things. So if we could continue in the study, I think I'd want to see a bigger sample size to show that, you know, we're looking at different populations outside of a community mental health center too, because people go, oh, this is just for community mental health. And I'm like, no, no, it's also relevant to supervision in private practice. It just showed up in community mental health first. Okay. That makes sense. And what has been probably the greatest lesson that you've learned during this process? You know, it, it definitely helped me embrace the vulnerability of telling my story as to why this was so important to me personally. Um, you know, I was just like, oh, I'm doing supervision well. And underneath all that, it was a determination to not do what was done to me, right? I mean, that's the emotional side of it. And as soon as I started to own that in our trainings and presentations on this model, people came up to me after or acknowledged even in the middle of the training, oh, that was me too. I had a horrible supervision experience, which is heartbreaking and not something we want to have continue forward. So I'm really hopeful this model and other models like it can rewrite what supervision should be because it needs to be different. Yeah, and I've heard those same stories that people feel traumatized by their clinical supervisor or that they that was all they know that yeah. or that was all they knew was a bad clinical supervisor. And so now they're just feeling kind of lost. Like one, they don't have confidence in their clinical skills. Like, am I doing this right? And two, when they go on to maybe consider becoming a clinical supervisor, they really don't know where to start. So it's amazing that you have this model and we're doing a training on it, which I'm really excited for. It's going to be in June. Oh my gosh. What's that date? June, <laughs> June 24th. <What>? Yes. <laughs> June 24th. So if you are interested in learning more about the empowerment model of clinical supervision, there is a link in the show notes to join us for that training. It is free also for the members of the RISE directory. It's included within your membership. But if you are not a member of the RISE directory yet, then it will be $27.99 definitely worth the investment. Um, and also too, Kara, I resonated with your story because I hear of people who feel stuck with their clinical supervisor. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I say a lot is we are never stuck as mental health professionals. Uh, we always have options and that is one of the reasons why I'm so passionate about the rise directory is so that you know what your options are. You know, it reiterates Absolutely. that you're not stuck. So if you feel like you're in a toxic relationship, or even if your clinical supervisor just isn't as available as you need them, or isn't a good fit for you, or if your job doesn't offer that, then it gives you options and it lets you know, you know, who is available in your state and around the country uh, for clinical supervision. Amazing. Such a wonderful resource. Absolutely. Yes, yes, we're so excited for it. Um, and one thing that you mentioned, you, we talked about what makes a bad clinical supervisor, but I'm wondering what qualities make a good clinical supervisor and what are people really looking for when they're, when they're looking for a clinical supervisor? Mm -hmm. I think the biggest quality that if Christina was in this interview would also say is um, that the supervisor responds with curiosity. So most of these green clinicians are still learning. I'm still learning. I think most of us are, you know, if we're in a healthy spot of like, oh, we're never done learning. <laughs> and so when we work with these at-risk cases or these really complicated cases, we are going to make mistakes. We're human, right? We're human first and professional second. And Christina was the person to teach me that through her own actions, if we make a mistake, we can recover from that. You know, she used to joke that there was like two ethical no-nos that we can't really recover from. And you can guess what those are. Um, <laughs> but, you know, for everything else, she would have our back and she would help us fix whatever was going wrong, whether it was an angry caseworker or a family that was disgruntled, that we could work through some of that as clinicians. 
And so having some curiosity of what's going on or what the choices are for our supervisees, I think is really important. Not to be a, what are you doing and why did you do that reaction? But to be like, help me understand what you were thinking about when you made the decision to document this or not document this, um, to not do a suicide assessment, for example, or whatever that looks like. And so she taught me to be cool and collected and really just be curious to say, help me understand, because we aren't always next to our supervisee when they make these choices or are put in really weird situations with clients. And that sounds like a really good tip for any time that we're, because I kind of picture myself in that situation and wanting to really say, what were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, Why did that's you a reaction. <laughs> Why did you do that? But it's much more professional and um, and empowering to phrase it like you did. So I love that, uh, you know, help me understand. And I know my clinical supervisor used that term on me as well. Um, <laughs> but it challenges you as the supervisee to really go back to that moment and say, oh, well, this is what I was thinking, but now that I say it out loud and I'm not in the heat of the moment, um, you know, this action might have been a better way to approach it. Um, so just yeah. even talking about it out loud helps to process, you know, what, and what happens. The critical thinking, or maybe they, you know, give them the space to say, you know, I didn't think, I didn't react the way I'd hoped to. So creating a safe space for that, rather than being like, what were you thinking? Obviously, the defensiveness shows up. And most of us are like, oh my God, I did something wrong. My supervisor's mad at me. I'm going to get fired, spiral, 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 right? That's all the thoughts that are negative. But if we say, help me understand what you're thinking about so we can work on this together, this idea of collaboration, people are probably more likely to show up authentically to be like, you know what? I didn't think, or I didn't even, it didn't even occur to me that that was a problem. And now they've had a learning experience versus a shaming experience. Right. Yeah, definitely. Awesome. So where can people learn more about you and the empowerment model of clinical supervision? Yeah. So a lot of things are on our website, which is empowermentmodelsupervision.com. And so that is where we've got more on the book. We have more about Christine and I and our backgrounds. Uh, we've got some free downloads for people who are looking for the handouts in the back of the book. They want those PDF formats of like, oh, I want to grab that and use that in my practice. And we also have a bunch of online courses that are linked through the website. So everything on the model itself to some other um, trainings on models of supervision, because there's so many out there and even how to evaluate your supervisee and their growth. So we have some on-demand courses in there. And then the book itself is on Amazon, both Kindle and paperback for people. Awesome. And all of those links are in the show notes. Thank you so much, Kara. I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. I hope to see everybody in our training. Thank you for listening to another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you are at all interested in the Empowerment Model of Clinical Supervision Workshop, it's happening on June 24th, 2022, live with Kara. You can ask her your questions yourself. This is a modern approach to clinical supervision. And the cost is going to be $27.99 unless you are a member of the RISE directory in which you get access to this workshop for free. So at this workshop, you're going to hear from Kara and hear her talk about ethical dilemmas that impact supervision. We're gonna identify the roles of a supervisor in supporting growth in their supervisees. We're gonna talk about how to enhance supervision skills for use in your private practice your organization or your agency. And we're gonna evaluate a modern approach for supervision and mental health leadership. It's important to know there are no CEUs approved at this time for the workshop, but it is definitely, definitely worth your time and investment, especially if you are in community mental health or working directly with supervisees who are helping people with mental health challenges. So tap the link in the show notes to register. It's only $27.99. Definitely, definitely worth it. And I will see you there. I will talk to you next week on the Social Workers Rise podcast. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Social Workers Rise. If you loved it, please open up your iTunes, 
tap the five stars and leave a short note on why you love listening to the Social Workers Rise podcast. Also, if you want to share it on social media, I absolutely love it. You have me fangirling all over you. Take a screenshot and share it and tag me at Social Workers Rise on Instagram and Facebook. Lastly, just want to leave a little bit of legal disclosure here that the information, opinions, and recommendations presented in the Social Workers Rise podcast are for general information only, and any reliance on the information provided in this podcast is done so at your own risk. This podcast should not be used in place of professional advice, therapy, or clinical supervision. And with that, my friends, I'll talk to you next week.